Hi, I'm Matt Reed from HRL, and I'm going to be talking to you about our recent result of demonstrating an exchange-only CNOT using the Sledge Qubit architecture. So the rough outline of my talk um, is the first third I'll be talking to you about exchange-only qubits and why we're interested in them. The next third we'll be talking about the specific di device we're using here today, uh, talking about how we tune it up and control it. And finally, I'll show you the actual two-qubit gate uh, result. So first, exchange-only qubits. So we study these uh, devices called silicon heterostructure quantum dots at HRL. Um, these are devices that can trap single electrons in gated uh, heterostructures, like the cartoon shown on the right here. Uh, their electrons are confined in the z direction uh, by the silicon heterostructure boundary, and in the x and y direction with electrostatic gates that are placed on the top of the device. Uh, and we use the spin degree of freedom of the electron to store our quantum information. The Pauli exclusion principle uh, is actually a really important resource for uh, control of these devices. So uh, the, in this case, the Pauli exclusion principle manifests as a swap-like contact inter interaction between neighboring spins uh, and is known as exchange. Uh, exchange can be used to control, uh, read out, and initialize uh, spins. Uh, there are several advantages to this approach to spin qubits as opposed to uh, other uh, architectures. Um, the most obvious of which is that uh, silicon can be enriched to allow exceptionally long coherence times. Uh, there's also uh, less disorder from gate oxides relative to MOS devices. Uh, and controlling coupling is straightforward relative to uh, donor qubits. Also, uh, assuming that you have good valley splitting, which is uh, uh, admittedly a big stipulation, uh, state prep and measurement uh, is also uh, easy in, in high fidelity, easy in the sense that uh, you don't need uh, exotic electronics. I'd encourage you also to see this uh, recent review that came out on the archive. There's actually been uh, three major papers that just came out uh, as of uh, me recording this talk. Uh, that demonstrate 99% uh, or better control fidelity of, of single spin qubits. That's uh, both single qubit and two qubit fidelity uh, from the, the Rick and Delft and, and Princeton groups. And something that you notice if you study these numbers for a second is uh, there's something very unusual on the scale of most uh, quantum systems, which is that uh, the two qubit gates here are as good, if not better, than single qubit operations. And this is a reflection of the fact that uh, for these systems, exchange is a really natural and convenient source of high-quality entanglement, uh, at least when you have non-degenerate spins. Um, and in contrast, the single qubit rotations, which are normally the relatively easy interaction to get in qubits, here uh, you have to introduce new complications like micromagnets uh, that actually might pose uh, uh, challenges. And this is a question we'll come back to in, in just a second. Um, but given that exchange is so good and, and naturally available in these systems, can you make a qubit that only uses exchange and doesn't need uh, uh, extra accoutrements. And so the actual system that we measure at HRL is not an individual spin. We're actually uh, using what's called an encoded qubit. Um, so there we're using uh, these electron spins these, uh, as a fabric in which to encode qubits. So first a word on what we mean by encoded qubits. This is a, a general idea uh, where you engineer a new quantum object uh, that's composed of multiple individual quantum systems. And so the, the really cool thing about this is that you can choose properties, you can engineer properties that this encoded qubit can have that are not shared by the constituent parts. So there are a lot of examples of this in the recent literature. Uh, for example, cat qubits and GKP codes in microwave photons or phonons. And also uh, there's a recent demonstration using harmonic motion in, in ion traps. So here we're using the exchange-only decoherence-free subsystem, which is a uh, encoded qubit where we encode the information into three individual electron spins. Uh, there, the Hilbert space is reduced to two dimensions through a combination of initialization and gate design. The important thing to ensure here is that we're insensitive to what's called the gauge degree of freedom, uh, which can remain in a, in a mixed state. And we'll come back to that in a moment. And the really nice thing about this is, as it says on the tin, uh, you can get full control using only exchange interaction. So you don't need microwaves or, or magnets or spin orbit coupling. We should be upfront, though, that uh, there is uh, some both obvious and not so obvious costs of this approach. Uh, the first being that you need three electrons for a single qubit as opposed to only one. You can also have leakage outside of your encoded subspace. Uh, and also leakage can spread if you're not careful. And that's really a key item that we'll come back to. Before we move on from this slide, let me just point out this cartoon in the lower left, uh, where we have the three electrons that are trapped in the device uh, with barriers in between them that are controlled by JZ and JN. Uh, and JZ uh, modulates a Z rotation on the block sphere. Uh, and JN causes a rotation around this N axis, which is 120 degrees off of the block sphere. So we think that despite the drawbacks of the DFSs, the benefits uh, of them far outweigh the costs. Uh, and there's a lot of ways of making this argument, but I'm going to make it in the context of, of fault tolerance. So fault tolerance, uh, fault tolerant quantum computing, um, which is you know uh, what we're all here to do, uh, requires uh, a couple of 
uh, quite stringent criteria. The most common uh, of which is uh, just that errors are rare. So this is also known as being below the fault tolerant threshold. Uh, and so on that metric, DFS qubits uh, look pretty good. We just put out a paper recently showing 99.7% spam fidelity. Uh, we've shown uh, uh, several times 99.9% .9 single qubit fidelity. Uh, so this is, you know, the fidelities of our, of our operations are, are up there with the best of them. Although, uh, as it says here, there are many qubits that can claim to have relatively high fidelity. The second criteria for fault tolerance is uh, that you have lots of qubits. So you need both lots of physical qubits and numerous measurement channels to extract information from those arrays. Uh, this is also just commonly referred to as being scalable. Um, there are reasons to be optimistic uh, about exchange-only qubits being scalable. So first of all, these qubits are quite small. They're only a few hundred nanometers in size. Uh, they're fabricated using semiconductor technologies. Um, there's also the, the way which we control them, which we'll get into in a moment, um, uses only baseband control, uh, which is uh, more convenient for generating signals and delivering them. But again, uh, there are many qubits that can claim to be scalable. Um, the third criteria, which is not so well uh, advertised because it's sort of a little bit squishier, it's, it's less concrete, um, is that errors need to be well behaved uh, to, for fault tolerance to work. Um, and by well behaved, you can say lots of things, but for example, you could mean uh, the errors are, are described by a pali channel that are uncorrelated in space and time, and they also don't spread as a result of doing computation with your qubits. Um, and this is a criteria where we think that DFS qubits have a really big advantage compared to most other qubits, um, which is that we expect the errors that are associated with our qubit to be fairly tolerable in the sense that they could be corrected by uh, the, the processes of fault tolerance. And so what are the reasons for this? The first is that exchange is a contact interaction between highly localized electrons. So what that means is that exchange only turns on when these electrons are actually physically touching each other. And these electrons are very highly localized. They're sort of like an exponential Gaussian wave function. And so both you can have ex exponential suppression of exchange with distance. So you can have very high levels of exchange uh, between neighboring qubits. But next nearest neighbors will have, for all functional purposes, zero exchange energy. And also, because again, these are overlapping wave functions, you can have very, very large dynamic ranges. So you can have both very, very small exchange energies and very, very large exchange energies uh, that are accessible to you uh, in your normal control space. And this is helpful for both coherent and, and classical crosstalk. The next criteria is that uh, DFS qubits are immune to global magnetic field fluctuations. So it's kind of funny. We're actually encoding information in, in spins, but they, the magnetic field that we're encoding them in doesn't matter. And in fact, you can operate this qubit in zero magnetic fields. So all of your spins are degenerate with each other. And the, the thing that's really nice about this is that if you weren't immune to global fluctuations, then you could have really highly correlated errors across your array. And this is actually the origin of the name decoherence-free subsystem. And finally, the, the third criteria, which again is something that um, I'm basically in putting in here to allude to a later part of the talk, is that the, the gates that you perform on these qubits can be designed to be error resistant. So uh, you can choose the properties of your encoded gates and, and make them more or less resistant to certain types of errors. I hopefully convince you of some of the reasons that exchange-only qubits could be interesting. But uh, if you don't actually have the ability to entangle two of them, it really doesn't get you anywhere. So why hasn't an exchange-only two-qubit gate been demonstrated yet? And really, it comes down to the fact that two-qubit gates are very complicated. Um, the two gates that we're going to be demonstrating today, the two entangling gates, uh, respectively use 27 and 45 exchange pulses, uh, whereas a single spin uh, uh, operation that were demonstrated by those papers that I had before um, only use a single exchange pulse. So there's a huge explosion in complexity here. First, we should answer the obvious question, which is why are they so complicated? And that's really a reflection of the fact that you just have a really large Hilbert space. You have six spins that you want to treat as two spins. Um, and so not only do you need to construct an interaction that does your desired operation, like a controlled not or a controlled Z, but you also have several other criteria that you want to satisfy, either satisfy strictly or just optimize. So the first criteria uh, that I mentioned uh, earlier is that the gate needs to be independent of the gauge degree of freedom. So this is the total spin degree of freedom of the DFS. Um, so that's sort of entry stakes. But uh, beyond that, you really also want to design your gate to limit error propagation for fault tolerance reasons. So you don't want to have like leakage be spread around as a result of doing this operation. The other uh, sort of optimization is that you just want to decouple noise as much as possible. You want your operation to be as high fidelity as, as it can be. The, the fact that there's all these uh, competing criteria is, is really reflected in the two gates that we're demonstrating here today. So the first of which is the Fong Wang Zura controlled Z gate, or actually we're, we're going to be demonstrating the controlled not gate, which is closely related. And this is a gate that is an exchange-only gate that is independent of the gauge degree of freedom. So that's, in some sense, the simplest controlled uh, operation that we can do. 
There's also this other operation called the leakage controlled controlled Z, or LCCZ, which is considerably more pulses, in this case 45 pulses instead of only 27. Uh, and in addition to being gauge invariant, it also um, doesn't spread leakage from one qubit to another. So this is like this is something uh, that again we think is is going to be really valuable for fault tolerance. And for more information about uh, these gates and how they were developed, uh, please check out Thaddeus Ladd's talk. We come back to the original question, which is why this hasn't happened yet. And the answer is just that you really need an excellent device in order to demonstrate these gates. You need something that's both high yielding, in the sense that you're able to control all these spins, and you also need it to be high performance. And you need to be able to perform all these operations to actually get a result that you can measure. And so uh, happy to report that our new sledge process, which I'm going to be talking about next, uh, can reliably produce such devices. Next part of the talk is what is this sledge thing? So SLEDGE is uh, an acronym for Single Layer Etch Defined Gate Electrode. So this is a type of device where uh, the, the name is referring to the fact that all of the electrodes that control the electrostatic environment in our, in our device are etched onto a single layer of metal. Uh, those uh, gates are then contacted by vias, which then route out to uh, bond pads. And these devices are grown and fabricated at, at HRL. So here's an SEM image. That, uh, showing all of the gates uh, with labels associated with them. So P1 is where one of the dots would be confined. The X1 gate controls the exchange energy next to its neighbor, the P2, and so on. There's also measure dots and uh, uh, baths where electrons can be um, exchanged for initialization. Uh, below, uh, the first picture here is the second picture. This is a cut through the active region, uh, showing the vias that contact down to the gates. And you see uh, we've sort of drawn a cartoon over them, showing where the electrons are confined. Uh, in that little narrow uh, white strip, which is the silicon well. Uh, for the experts in the audience, uh, the valley energy in this device on the P1 side was something like 70 microelectron volts, and on the P6 side was only 14 microelectron volts. Uh, so the fact that the P1 side is so much better, uh, we'll generally prefer to measure on the M1 side when we have that opportunity. The epitaxy in this device, uh, we had a 5 nanometer SIGI well, 800 ppm silicon and natural germanium. And the typical performance parameters for, for the spins are a T2 star of three and a half microseconds, and the number of oscillations is, is 55. Uh, we can add some colors here and, and show this cartoon on the right, which is sort of, again, a th more three-dimensional view of what's going on here, uh, where, again, we have electrons that are trapped at the SIGI barrier with uh, the electrostatics uh, on the top. And again, we have uh, a DFS qubit on the right and on the left, uh, where here the Z axis on the qubit on the right is controlled by the X5 gate and the N axis by the X4 gate. And again, I would encourage you to see uh, Mike Jura's talk, where he talks a lot more about how these devices are fabricated and optimized. There's also a paper uh, that was uh, recently published. So now I'm going to show you a quick video, again, sort of zooming around this device to, sh to make sure we understand the geometry of what we're talking about. So here we're starting with the SEM, uh, again, the, this one that you saw before. We can highlight the, the P and M gates, the tunnel and barrier gates, the baths, and the field gates. And we have the vias come up and, and grow off to the back end of line that routes out to bond pads. Advancing again, now we can cut away uh, half the device and see where the TEM that I showed you before would be oriented in this in three-dimensional space, where again we see the, the vias come up. And of course, those lines are not suspended in free space. There's a dielectric layer that holds them up. Now zooming in and, and returning to the cartoon space, we see another DFS qubit on the left here where the z-axis is controlled by the x1 gate and, and uh, the n-axis by x2. And we can see what happens when we actually are applying exchange gates. So here we're applying voltage pulses onto the x gates, which cause neighboring electrons to uh, interact with each other. The size of the voltage pulse uh, uh, sets by how much the electrons are interacting. And you'll notice that we only ever do one interaction at a time. And now that we zoom out here, uh, we can actually see the full gate sequence that was just played in that cartoon. And that's actually the, the thumb laser are a controlled knot gate that we'll be showing later on. Again, advancing, we can see the top of the, the device again, where we are applying these voltage pulses. Uh, and we transition into an SEM of the top of the device, where again, these are the wires on the top that route out to the bond layers. Um, and you see the, the associated labels of what each, each gate does. Now, uh, let's discuss uh, signals. What are these signals that we're delivering, and, and how do we generate them, and, and how do we deliver them? So generally speaking, all of our control pulses uh, look like this cartoon on the left here, where you have uh, some baseband voltage, in this case uh, 700 millivolts, that then steps up to a higher value, of, uh, say 800 millivolts, for some period of time, in this case 10 nanoseconds, and then drops back down to its earlier voltage. And what's physically happening here is that we're moving from what we call the idle position, uh, where the exchange energy is a very small value, something like 10 kilohertz, uh, 
Uh, we then drop the barrier down uh, and cause the exchange energy to shoot up because these electrons are now touching each other uh, to something like 100 megahertz. We hold there for some period of time, and then we drop back down to the idle position. And what this is doing is modulating the exchange energy uh, from 10 kilohertz to something like 100 megahertz. So we can make some observations about these signals. First of all is, because we're just looking for some phase evolution, the integral of J over time is the only thing that matters. That is to say, the fact that this pulse is square is not important. Uh, and in fact, it won't be square when these pulses are delivered. We only have something like 150 megahertz of control bandwidth. Uh, so in, in practice, these pulses will be rounded out a little bit by the time uh, they are delivered to the device. And that's the reason we actually have this idle position, where we pad every control pulse by something like uh, 5 to 30 nanoseconds of delay, just to make sure that the sort of the tail of this low-pass uh, square wave doesn't interfere with uh, the next uh, control pulse. That we would call this intersymbol interference. Another high-level statement is that um, in these devices, we uh, have low time resolution, so we can quantize in something like 5 nanoseconds at a time. Uh, but there's high voltage resolution. As, as we'll see later, we control our pulses by having fine control of, of the amplitude of, of each of these pulses. And finally, uh, something that's a little bit unusual about our control scheme is that our signal has both DC and AC components, and it spans a very large dynamic range in time. And what, a technical detail I'd like to uh, dive in just for a second is the fact that we have both AC and DC uh, signal components to our control signals. Uh, actually poses a, a, a challenge. So normally in cryogenic physics, you need to deliver signals to your uh, device at millikelvin temperatures. Um, you need to make sure that the thermal noise coming from room temperature is not delivered to your device along with your signal. When you have AC signals, what's typically done is you just attenuate the signals by something like 30 or 50 dB. Uh, and if you have DC signals, you uh, simply narrow the bandwidth of that control uh, uh, sufficiently so that the, the integrated noise is small enough. Uh, and the reason for this difference is because if you have a DC bias, you don't want to burn a lot of power by attenuating that uh, and heat up your fridge. Um, but we, we actually don't get to do that here, or at least not quite as straightforwardly, because we really need a flat frequency response from 150 megahertz all the way down to DC because of the mixed signal nature of our, of our control poles. So our solution to this is actually to split the two signal components and recombine them uh, back at millikelvin. So here's, uh, advancing the slide here, we have our dilution fridge wiring diagram, which is a, a, mo a slight modification of a figure that is in the paper in the lower right here. Um, and uh, there's a lot of details, but let me focus in on the upper right corner here where we have the cubic control area. So here we have a, a National Instruments 5451 AWG that controls the high frequency side of things. Uh, and then we also have a DAC, which is a custom instrument based on this analog devices part. Um, those two signals are input into what we call the high-speed adder circuit, which is a combination of a Tektronix uh, splitter and a custom PCB. And what this is, is it takes both signals in and puts both signals out, but the two output signals take two different paths. So one takes a high-frequency capacitively coupled side, uh, where DC signal is, is rejected on that side, and then the other side just carries the DC component because it has a relatively low bandwidth. Um, and then those signals are recombined at the bottom of the fridge. And the thing that this high-speed adder circuit does is it has tunable potentiometers that allow you to fine-tune the, the uh, resistance on the two sides in order to make sure that the two signals are attenuated by the same amount. And so the result of this process is that we can uh, deliver signals uh, over a wide range in bandwidth all the way down to DC uh, without heating up our fridge excessively. And I'd, again, I'd encourage you to see this archive uh, paper. So how do we actually determine what those signals that we deliver are? What are these DC voltages coming from, and how do the amplitudes get set? So unfortunately, this is a really long conversation. So I could easily spend an hour just dis discussing how devices are tuned up. Uh, thankfully, I'll, we have a lot of uh, talks here at March meetings, so I can reference you to a lot more details here. But let me just uh, sort of move through it quickly and, and give you an idea of, of the high-level situation. So the first step is, is what we call charge stability. So this is a process of uh, sweeping gates against each other uh, to figure out how to put one electron in each dot and also have the, the coupling between them be approximately correct. Um, and you can think of this as basically coming up with our initial guess for the DC component of those control pulses. And uh, check out Reed Andrews' invited talk uh, where he's discussing our work towards automating this process. The next step is readout initialization. This is figuring out how to convert spin information into uh, something that we can detect, which is charge information, uh, and also optimizing that, the, the initialization process. And you can think of this, again, as basically refining those DC voltages to sort of get the tunnel couplings just right to, so that this process is optimized. Um, this is, again, uh, you can check out uh, Jacob Blumhoff's paper, which has been recently posted on the archive. And we also have a recording of his 2020 March meeting talk where he discusses this uh, in more detail at our, on our website. Uh, the next step is exchange optimization. So this is figuring out how to make those electrons uh, 
talk to each other in a, in a way that's relatively high fidelity. Um, there's a lot of uh, criteria that should be optimized in order to make that exchange operation successful. Um, and again, you can think of this as sort of our initial guess at the AC voltages, at the, at the voltages of those 10 nanosecond pulses that we put on top of the DC. Uh, and you can check out both Edwin Acuna's talk on T1J and Bobby Lanza's talk on, on sledge tune-up, which is actually going to be delivered by uh, another HRL employee, Nathan Holman. And then finally, we have calibration and verification. Once we know how to do exchange, we do a fine tuning to figure out exactly how uh, to get each angle as a function of, of voltage. Um, and uh, that's through a combination of optimizing uh, our, our path in what we call this fingerprint, uh, doing voltage Robbie oscillations to figure out again uh, exactly what amplitude gives you what rotation. And we can verify that this entire process uh, was successful by doing something like uh, randomized benchmarking. Uh, so here we're, we're doing what's called blind randomized benchmarking, which is a variant that properly treats leakage. And in this device, we're getting something like 99.9% uh, fidelity of single qubit operations. It's worth emphasizing here that these operations use an average of 2.7 exchange pulses. Uh, so we're actually getting 99.9% .9 fidelity of something that's, in some sense, more complicated than uh, the single spin uh, CNOTs. And I'd encourage you to see uh, Reed Andrews' paper and also Brian Fong's talk about some of the subtleties about QCVV uh, in our system. OK, so now we can go ahead and proceed to demonstrate our two qubit gates. So um, on the upper left uh, of the slide here, we have uh, what we call an exchange pulse diagram of the fong wong zura c naught. So this is showing the angles as a function of time that we need uh, in order to implement this gate. Uh, through the process I just described, we convert each of these angles into uh, specific voltage pulses on the gates. And uh, we can do process tomography on the c naught gate here. Uh, and we see uh, the, the tomogram on the bottom left. So uh, both the, the data and the idealized data. And we see, uh, you know, it looks like the operation we're looking for. Um, you can't really say much uh, beyond that. It looks like this sort of complicated math and this uh, calibration procedure is, is doing approximately what we expect. We can do the same thing uh, for a swap operation. This is something I haven't talked about before. But uh, because the exchange interaction is intrinsically a swap-like interaction, uh, the swap gate is, is actually quite simple and can work very well. You'll notice that all of the rotations that are in the uh, exchange uh, pulse diagram for swap is just a pi pulse. And there's also sort of like a nice symmetry to the operation, whereas fong is much more complicated. And again, we can do process tomography on that, and, and we see that it's basically doing what we expect. The obvious question, though, is how well are we doing uh, what is the fidelity of these operations? And basically, the answer is that tomography is not really the right tool for it. It's highly sensitive to things like spam. Uh, you have to measure a lot of stuff. There's a lot of information here that is telling a lot more than we actually want to know if all we're interested is in fidelity. So uh, in, we, what we do instead here at HRL is, of course, randomized benchmarking. So randomized benchmarking uh, is a much more robust uh, tool for measuring gate fidelity. Um, it has a lot of nice properties, as I'm sure everyone is aware. Uh, things like it's insensitive to spam. Uh, you only need readout on one side rather than on both sides. You, you don't need correlated measurements as you do with tomography. Um, there's a lot less data to measure. This is just a simpler measurement. Uh, it's also just heavily validated. This is something that's been a standard technique uh, in the community for years. As opposed to single qubit randomized benchmarking, uh, where you only need a, a few pulses, with two qubit randomized benchmarking, there's actually 11,000 unique uh, members in the Clifford group. And so you need to randomly sample from a very large group. And so rather than optimizing each of these 11,000 operations, we construct them using uh, the recipe that's shown on the slide of using the swap, C0, and single qubit operations. So on average, each of these 11,000 Cliffords has 90% uh, of them has, has a CNOT, 50% uh, have a swap, and on average, uh, there are 3.1 single qubit Cliffords in each operation. So each uh, two qubit Clifford gate uh, uses an average of 41 exchange pulses. And so uh, here is our two qubit randomized benchmarking, uh, and we're seeing something like a 2.9% uh, average infidelity per Clifford. You can do the math based on the, the number 41 and see this is better than 99.9% uh, per pulse error. And this is actually uh, comparable to the two qubit Clifford uh, fidelity that we're seeing in these recent spin results. So we can also do uh, two qubit interleave benchmarking, uh, where now uh, by interleaving a gate of interest in between an at random Clifford, uh, we can determine the fidelity of just that gate. So uh, we can again do the von Wang Zura C naught, and we see something like 3.7% infidelity. This is actually a bit of a surprise because by far the the vast majority of two qubit Cliffords. Uh, include uh, a fong or a CNOT. So you'd expect uh, this operation to actually be higher fidelity than, than the average two qubit Clifford. 
Uh, and the reason for this discrepancy, this is in fact the correct number. Uh, the reason for this discrepancy is actually that these two gates were measured in slightly different conditions. So this is something we'll get back to in a moment. Uh, we can also do benchmarking on, on the swap operation. Uh, and as expected, it's uh, rather high fidelity. In fact, the fidelity is so good, it's rather hard to determine uh, just because you know the, the two curves that we're comparing are very similar to each other. Uh, and again, this is a reflection of the fact that th uh, the fundamental mechanism that we're using here, exchange, is, is inherently swap-like. And so this gate can be uh, very simple and, and designed to be very insensitive to uh, noise. And finally, uh, uh, as we mentioned at the top of the talk, we're also demonstrating this, the, the leakage controlled variant uh, of the entangling gate, uh, where we're, here we're doing the leakage controlled control Z, and we see something like a 6% infidelity. Um, so this is kind of funny because the two operations, the Fong Zura C0 and the LCCZ, are essentially the same operation, just up to Hadamard's, uh, but this fidelity is a lot worse. So why am I telling you about this? Uh, again, when you're talking about building a, a fault-tolerant computer, the leakage-controlled variant uh, could be a lot better because it won't cause leakage to spread. So we expect this to be a very interesting gate going forward. So where are these uh, infidelities coming from? So we can say right off the top that magnetic noise is, is the most important contributor to our air budget. Uh, so shown here on the right, again, is a cartoon zooming in on the environment seen by an individual electron. The magnetic field seen by the electron will be randomized by interactions of nuclear spins in the substrate. And so that uh, slowly fluctuating magnetic field is the biggest source of error here. So we can see that by doing kind of a funny experiment where we're going to do interleave benchmarking of nothing. We're going to do interleave benchmarking of an idle operation. We'll sweep the duration of that idle. And so here we're doing uh, IRB of 1.4 microsecond. Uh, idle operation, which, as as you'd expect from the fact that this is a, a significant fraction of T2 star, uh, is rather uh, low fidelity. is something like 14% infidelity. So we can plot uh, all of those idle operations alongside all the other gates that we've measured uh, so far today. Uh, and we see a couple of things. The first is that idle uh, matches very, very well to this heuristic of T gate over T2 star squared. So as expected, idle looks a lot like what we call in free induction decay, or T2 star uh, decay. So we can also look at uh, another gate here, which is the LCCZ, and we see that actually this gate performs much better than this free induction decay uh, heuristic. So uh, this is showing that the fact that the gate is working on these spins and permuting them around is actually tending to refocus some of the magnetic noise. Uh, and so yeah, compared to idle, this operation is much higher fidelity than you would expect. We should also say the swap operation is also uh, believed to be similarly magnetically resilient. Uh, but here, uh, we're sort of limited by uh, our ability to measure its infidelity, and it's, and it's likely limited by other things, too. Um, and so this is another sort of uh, nice property of, of exchange-only gates, which is that they can actually be, de be designed to be insensitive to certain error sources. Uh, the order that you apply these gates and the order that you move these spins around in uh, tends to cause uh, certain types of noise to become uh, less important in, in your overall gate fidelity. But of course, uh, this general optimization complicates uh, construction. So there's really a, a lot of art to, to designing these gates. Finally, let me uh, introduce a, a nice piece of physics that we can see. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take two qubit randomized benchmarking. So this is just uh, benchmarking, not interleaf benchmarking, uh, as a function of both the applied magnetic field uh, and the duration between pulses, the, the idle duration. So first of all, we can see uh, as a function of increasing magnetic field, the fidelity initially gets better. Uh, and this is a reflection of the fact that transverse nuclear magnetic fluctuations are being suppressed by the presence of this field. Uh, you can write down the Hamiltonian of uh, interactions between electrons and nuclear spins, uh, and you can expand out this s dot i term uh, and see that there, there are three terms, and two of which tend to be fast rotating in a, in a large field and will average away. Uh, so roughly, this interaction goes down uh, to a factor of one third its, uh, its, its strength at zero field. Uh, you also see that as magnetic field gets bigger, uh, the error again gets worse, and this is uh, likely due to spin orbit effects as described in the, the, the Ranjok paper. And finally, uh, uh, unsurprisingly, going faster generally uh, is better. So uh, if you can throw your pulses uh, more quickly, um, then uh, your device has less time to be susceptible to magnetic noise and your fidelity improves. Uh, there is, of course, a limit to this. If you make your idle time too short, then now your pulses will tend to interfere with each other. You also need uh, more interconnect bandwidth and things like that. That's uh, not just a free knob that you, that you have no matter what. 
So actually, we can come to the, the solution to the minor mystery from before, uh, which is that the interleaved gates that had seriously high infidelities uh, were actually measured at suboptimal conditions, as, uh, as described by this plot. So they were operated at, at zero magnetic field and a relatively long idle time. Whereas the, the sort of the generalized uh, two qubit benchmarking number that we showed you was taken in a more optimal condition. OK, so uh, conclusion. Uh, we've demonstrated universal control of two qubit, uh, two exchange only encoded qubits. So uh, we showed you uh, relatively high fidelity two qubit benchmarking, uh, also interleaved benchmarking of several gates of interest. So the next step uh, for this work is uh, first, you know, we can optimize uh, the operating conditions and get somewhat higher fidelity for these gates. Uh, we'd also like to formalize the error budget, figure out exactly where our errors are coming from. Um, we also would like to validate the leakage control aspect of the LCCZ gate. Uh, and also demonstrate leakage-aware uh, two-qubit benchmarking. So this is the extension of the blind randomized benchmarking that we introduced for single-qubit uh, uh, characterization. And again, I'd encourage you to see Brian Fong's talk for uh, work, uh, some interesting work there. The next steps for this technology in general. Um, so multiple layer devices are possible with sledge, and that should make possible non-trivial device geometries. We Also, of course, we'd be interested in making larger devices, just uh, more dots and more qubits. Uh, and in order to uh, improve uh, infidelities, the obvious two uh, uh, paths there are to improve isotopic enrichment, so reduce the uh, nuclear spins, and also improve signal conditioning so you can deliver your control pulses faster. Finally, I'd encourage you to see the Weinstein paper. So we're writing up a paper uh, that's not on the archive at the time of this recording, but should be by the time you see this uh, talk. Uh, and so check out that paper, too. So it should be obvious this is the work of many people at HRL, and we are hiring at all levels. So if you found this work interesting, please reach out. You can see our website, quantum.hrl.com, where we list a lot of our recent work and open positions. You can also email us at the address on this slide. So thank you for watching.